Now that we have covered both the drag cube system and fairing mechanics, we can finally tackle perhaps the most complicated system in KSP, the heating and temperature mechanics. First, we will take a look at how heating works, and then we will learn how to exploit the heating system for fun and profit. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that I now have a KSP Discord server, so if you're interested, head down to the video description to snag a link. Additionally, there is a link to a Google Doc that has some notes and supplementary materials for this video. That said, grab a drink and buckle up, because this is going to be a long one. First things first, to better understand the thermal model, we will need to turn on the thermal debug data in the debug menu. To do this, hit Alt F12, then expand the physics section and select the thermal tab, then check off both display thermal data in action menus and display thermal data GUI. Unlike drag cube debug data, none of this data is available in the VAB, so we will have to be in flight to see it. Now let's go ahead and break down the most important values, starting with the part action window debug data. The internal temp is the current part temperature expressed in Kelvin. All skin is the current skin temperature when either fully exposed to or fully shielded from shock heating. Exposed skin is the current skin temperature of the portion of skin exposed to shock heating when only partially exposed. Thermal mass is the energy required to raise the internal temp by 1 Kelvin. Conductive flux is the power flowing into or out of the part internal temperature from other connected parts internal temperatures. Convective flux is the power flowing into or out of the part skin via atmospheric or ocean convection. Radiative flux is the power flowing into or out of the part skin via radiation. Internal flux is the power being added or subtracted from part internals directly by core heat or radiators. Skin to internal flux is the power flow between the part's skin and the part's internals. Skin thermal mass is the energy required to raise skin temp by 1 degree Kelvin. A positive sign for flux always indicates heat transfer inwards, while a negative sign always indicates heat transfer outwards. Parts can have a multiplier to their thermal mass, which has a base value of 0.8 kilojoules per Kelvin per kilogram of mass for internal thermal mass, and 0.8 kilojoules per kelvin per square meter for skin thermal mass. A parts thermal mass multiplier can have some important ramifications for reentry, which we'll talk about later. There are a number of parts that have thermal mass multipliers that differ from the default, the most interesting of which will be included in the addendum document located in the video description. Additionally, there are a number of different environmental temperatures to keep in mind, each of which is responsible for an aspect of how your craft interacts with the heating system. Some of these values are visible to us in the thermal data GUI, and some are not. The first is space temp, which is the temperature of space itself and is always 4 degrees Kelvin. Next is the static ambient temp, which is the current temperature of the atmosphere around the craft. After this we have background radiation temp. This is the temperature used for part radiation for skin that is not currently exposed to shock heating. This value is always going to be between space temp and static ambient temp. The denser the atmosphere is, and the higher your Mach number, the closer this will be to the static ambient temp. The external temp is the temperature of the shock wave created by your velocity. It has a minimum value equal to the static ambient temp. Below Mach 2, it is equal to your velocity, and this continues to be approximately true up to about Mach 3. From Mach 3 to Mach 4 it doubles, and then it doubles again and then some by Mach 5. Above Mach 5, it is equal to your velocity to the 3 fourths power times 21. For EVE, DUNA, and any custom bodies templated from them, this temperature is multiplied by an additional 10%, while for Kerbal, Joule, and any custom bodies templated off of them, this temperature is divided by 2. The last two temperatures we need to consider are not visible to us in the thermal data GUI. The convective temp is the temperature used to transmit convective shock heating to any exposed skin on a part. For the frontmost part on a craft, it is equal to the static ambient temp plus half of the difference between the static ambient temp and the external temp. For parts that are not frontmost, it is equal to the static ambient temp plus 40% of the difference between static ambient temp and external temp. And the final temperature is the exposed background radiation temperature. This is used for part radiation for skin that is currently exposed to shock heating. This will always be between convective temp and space temp, and like background radiation temp, the denser the current atmosphere, and the higher your Mach number, the closer this is going to be to the convective temp. Now let's get into the real meat of the video, and talk about convection, aka shock heating or re-entry heating. When a part is in an atmosphere, it will be in one of three different skin modes, which determines how much shock heating the part is subject to, and is based on how exposed it is. This is calculated from our old friend the drag cube, 
Below Mach 0.94, this exposure is just equal to the sum of the Ock A's of all six faces of the drag cube. Above Mach 1.64, for each face, the Ock A is divided by the WDRG, and then this gets multiplied by the front, skin, and rear multipliers based on the angle of attack of the face and the Mach number. The exact calculation isn't important, and the too long didn't read is that side faces have very low exposure when supersonic, and so the vast majority of a part's exposure comes from the front face with some additional contribution from the rear face. Between Mach 0.94 and Mach 1.64, we linearly interpolate between the two values, i.e., if we are halfway in between at Mach 1.29, then we take half of the Mach 0.94 value and half of the Mach 1.64 value. The best way to reduce the exposure is to use a blunter front face and to reduce the overall area of the front face, and to a lesser extent, we want to also be doing this for the rear face as well. Additionally, any part that is not occluded in a fairing, cargo bay, or engine plate will cast a shock shadow behind it, and any parts that are in the shadow will have their exposure reduced based on how much of the part is within the shadow. A part totally in the shadow will have zero exposure. Multiple shock shadows together can further reduce the exposure of a large part, but they cannot reduce it all the way to zero. Finally, the exposure is divided by the sum of the Ockes of all six faces, and the resulting percentage determines what skin mode the craft will be in. If the craft is less than 0.1% exposed, it will be in unexposed all skin mode and will not take any shock heating. If the craft is more than 99.9% .9 exposed, it will be in exposed all skin mode and will take full shock heating. If the craft is more than 0.1% exposed, but less than 99.9% .9 exposed, it will be in exposed skin mode. In this mode, it will actually have two skin temperatures, and an unexposed skin temp acting as if it is in unexposed skin mode, and an exposed skin temp acting as if it is in exposed skin mode. Unexposed and exposed skin can trade heat back and forth via conduction, or if the exposure fraction changes. Convective shock heating is proportional to both the temperature difference between the craft's exposed skin and the convective temp, and to a value that we will call the convective constant. This seems simple enough at first glance, but the calculation for the convective constant is pretty brutal. The convective constant is proportional to the part exposed area, the turbulent flow multiplier, the part convection multiplier, and the current atmospheric density or the square root of the density, whichever is larger. The turbulent flow multiplier is usually 1, but if using a very blunt part at near sea level density and high speed, it will quickly scale up to a multiplier of 50. The part convection multiplier is almost always 1, with the sole exception of the shock cone, which has a multiplier of 0.75. Additionally, when below Mach 2, the convective constant is proportional to velocity, with an initial offset of 8 meters per second, meaning that even when not moving there will be some convection taking place. Above Mach 5, the convection constant is proportional to velocity cubed, but with a lower starting coefficient. In between Mach 2 and Mach 5, the convective constant is interpolated in the same manner as the external temp. The lower starting coefficient after Mach 5 means that there is actually a local maxima in the convective constant at about Mach 3.75, and a local minima at Mach 5, after which point it resumes increasing. Additionally, there is a convective constant hard cap at 63% of a part's skin thermal mass. This effectively soft caps shock heating, as after reaching the convective constant hard cap, entry heating will no longer increase from diving deeper into denser atmosphere, only from increasing velocity, since a higher velocity increases the convective temp. Keep in mind that this doesn't mean you can dive as deep into the atmosphere as you want, because the main heat rejection method during re-entry is via radiation, and the deeper you go in the atmosphere, the higher the exposed background temp is, and this will reduce the effectiveness of radiation, meaning you can burn up because you are no longer emitting as much. Radiation, mercifully, is much less complicated than convection. There are three sources of radiative heating and cooling. Solar flux, body flux, and black body flux. Solar flux always adds heat to the craft, and is based off of a set flux value given for Kerbin's distance from Kerbal, and follows the inverse square law, so doubling the distance cuts solar flux by a factor of 4. Additionally, it is proportional to the area of a part's drag cube that is exposed to Kerbal. Interestingly, the craft's distance to Kerbal is the distance to Kerbal's surface and not Kerbal's center, meaning that as your distance to Kerbal's surface approaches zero, solar flux approaches infinity. The area exposed to Kerbal is calculated as the area of each drag cube face 
times the cosine of the angle between that face and a vector pointing directly at Kerbal. Faces at an angle of 90 degrees or greater are considered to have zero exposed area. The total area of a part is then reduced based on other parts on the same craft that are casting a shadow on it. As mentioned for shock heating, multiple shadows together can further reduce the exposure of a large part, but they cannot reduce it all the way to zero. Body flux uses a similar area calculation to solar flux, but is based on the current orbited body as long as that body is not a star. Body flux is almost always extremely small, and the exact calculation the game is actually running to calculate it is rather hideous, so while it's interesting to note that it exists, it's unlikely to be ever important to consider. Suffice it to say, it works functionally identical to solar heating, just orders of magnitude weaker. Last is black body flux, which is the radiated energy exchange between a part and the sky as a whole, ignoring Kerbal and the body you are currently orbiting or landed on. It is proportional to the sum of the Ake okay values for all six faces of the parts drag cube. If the craft is in a vacuum, it is proportional to the space temp to the fourth power minus part skin temp to the fourth power. If the craft is in an atmosphere, it is proportionate to the exposure fraction times the exposed background temp to the fourth power minus the part exposed skin temp to the fourth power, plus one minus the exposure fraction times the background temp to the fourth power minus the skin temp to the fourth power. Additionally, parts have an emissivity slash absorptivity constant that scales the result of all flux calculations. By default, it is 0 0.4 but there are a large number of exceptions. The most interesting exceptions can be found in the addendum document located in the description. Conduction, like radiation, is pretty straightforward. Heat can conduct from part to part via skin to skin transfer and internal to internal transfer. Heat can also conduct from a part's skin to its internals. Conduction from one part to another is proportional to the heat conductivity of each part and the temperature difference between each. For internal to internal conduction, it is also proportional to the attached area, whereas for skin to skin conduction, it is proportional to the square root of the attached area. For node attached parts that are not the root part, attached area is the W area of the node attached face of the part that the heat is flowing into. For radially attached parts that are not the root part, attached area is the W area of the largest face of the drag cube of the child part, regardless of heat flow direction. For the root part, for node attached internal to internal conduction into the root part, attached area is the W area of the node attached face of the root part. For node attached skin to skin conduction into the root part, attached area is 30% of the W area of the node attached face of the root part. In all other cases involving the root part, attached area is 0.01, which is also the minimum area for any other case. Additionally, if one of the parts is shielded in a fairing, bay, or engine plate, and the other isn't, which includes the fairing bay or engine plate itself, there is a flat factor of 100 reduction to heat transfer. Conduction from a part skin to its internals, and vice versa, is proportional to the difference between skin and internal temp, the heat conductivity of the part, the skin to internal multiplier of the part, and the sum of all six AK values. The default heat conductivity of 0.12 and default skin internal conduction molt of 1 are used for most parts, but there are a number of exceptions. As always, see the addendum document for interesting exceptions. To illustrate some of the more subtle results of the thermal model, let's compare the 10 meter inflatable heat shield to the 3.75 meter heat shield. I have built a chart in Desmos, link in the description, that estimates the maximum velocity the part can travel at in a given set of atmospheric conditions before exploding. For this example, this is 35 km altitude on Kerbin, a common aerobraking altitude. The x-axis is Mach number, and the y-axis is kilowatts. Let's look at the inflatable heat shield first. The orange line is the convection heating or cooling with the skin at its max temp of 3500 Kelvin. We can see that below Mach 6.5, convection is actually cooling the craft. We can also see a kink in the graph at a little over Mach 14.5. This is the convection soft cap, and is at a rather unusually high speed. The reason for this is simple. The soft cap is based on a part skin thermal mass, and the inflatable heat shield has a 7.5 times multiplier to its thermal mass. Purple is the radiation being emitted by the heat shield, and due to its very high temperature, it is always cooling through this speed range. Thanks to the heat shield's conduction being 1 12th default, the skin to int flux, shown as the blue line, is basically zero. Finally, the green line represents the total balance of heat moving into and out of the skin, 
At a little over Mach 13.5, the heat coming in from convection is balanced by the heat leaving the skin by a radiation and conduction to the internals. In other words, at 35 kilometers over Kerbin, an inflatable heat shield can travel at about Mach 13.5, or 4.4 kilometers per second, while barely not blowing up. Now let's look at the 3.75 meter heat shield with the blader removed. One thing that is noticeable is that the kink from the soft cap is a lot more subtle and is at a much lower speed, occurring just before Mach 7.5. This is because the 3.75 meter heat shield has a skin thermal mass multiplier of the default of just one. This greatly reduces the convection heating the heat shield takes at high speed, since it is soft capped much lower. As a result, radiation is able to keep up much longer and is able to achieve a wildly successful result of nearly Mach 18, or about 5.85 kilometers per second. It is able to thoroughly thrash the inflatable shield, even though it has less than half the emissive constant and 200 Kelvin lower max temp, simply because its much lower thermal mass multiplier soft caps it at a much lower level of convection heating. Now that we've spent all that effort understanding how shock heating and solar heating work, let's look at how to simply avoid them rather than trying to deal with them. As we discussed, both convection and radiation are applied to the skin of the part based on the area of the drag cube. This has a few important consequences. Namely, partially occluding a face, or faces, of the drag cube reduces area, and thus absorbed heat. Fully occluding all six faces of the drag cube prevents absorbing any heat from any external source, since there is no skin area to absorb it. Unfortunately, this only applies to a select few parts. There must be at least one node facing in all six directions. The stock hubmax and micro node, making history's square and isosceles triangle structural panels, and breaking ground rotors, servos, and turbo shafts are all parts that this trick can be used on. Additionally, parts occluded in a fairing, cargo bay, or payload bay cannot absorb heat from any external source. Parts that are node attached to one of the engine nodes or the top node of an engine plate also cannot absorb heat from any external source as long as the engine plate shroud is turned on and still attached. Finally, as was mentioned earlier, for solar flux, body flux, and shock convection, Parts can cast shadows on other parts behind them. Interestingly, behind in this case doesn't just mean being placed fully behind another part relative to the heat source, but also being placed inside another part. In summary, a part occluded by a fairing, cargo bay, or engine plate is protected from all heating types, is able to physically shield other parts from solar flux and body flux, but is unable to physically shield other parts from shock heating. A part with all six drag cube faces occluded is protected from all heating types and is able to shield other parts from solar flux, body flux, and shock heating. Let's try an example. We start with the fairing as our root part. Remember, for a root fairing, only the base gets counted for the drag cube. Let's build it out two segments. Next, we will place an adapter on the rear node of the fairing and offset so that its center is shielded by the fairing, but the adapter physically covers the whole fairing base. Next, we place an adapter on the front node of the fairing, and on the front node of the adapter we place a DLC structural panel, which we then offset so that it is in front of the fairing. Then we place another adapter on the front node of the structural panel, and offset it into the fairing as well. Now, using cubic octagonal struts, we occlude the four side faces of the structural panel's drag cube, and offset the struts into the fairing. The panel has had all six drag cube faces occluded, so it can no longer receive heating, but it is able to shield the fairing from shock heating, and the first adapter is shielding the fairing from solar heating and body emission heating. As you can see, this craft has very little drag and is taking almost no heating, even though it is currently flying through the atmosphere of the sun. However, if we pitch too far off prograde, the fairing is now peeking out from behind the shock heating shield, and the craft disintegrates as the fairing explodes. Now let's try an example using a fairing and an engine plate. We start by placing an engine plate down. Next, we place a fairing on the open engine node of the engine plate, then build it out two segments. We then place a cubic octagonal strut on the end node of the engine plate to close it off. Now, we offset the fairing backwards so it shields the engine plate and offset the cubic strut into the fairing. Here, the engine plate fully shields the fairing from any heating, and the fairing shields every other part. This is much more part efficient than using a node occluded structural panel to protect from shock heating, and since the engine plate can shield any size part attached to its engine nodes, we don't even need to use a root fairing, so this technique can be used in many different places on a single craft. As you can see, this craft has no drag at all and is taking no heating even though it is currently deep in the atmosphere of the sun. We can orient the craft any direction we would like and nothing happens to it. It's perfectly safe. <laughs>
Well, there you have it folks. The thermal model for KSP as fully explained as I can manage. With that, I have completed the necessary videos to fully explore the aerodynamic and thermal model. This isn't to say that Kerbal University is finished. While I may have completed all currently planned KU videos, there's always more to learn about KSP, and with KSP2 right around the corner, a whole new set of systems are ready and waiting to be picked apart and exploited. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.